Good morning and welcome to day 63 of 365 Days Towards Racial Change. My name is Tom Lynch Nye back, and uh, we're just moving along. We've got some great momentum going here. We'll go to our standard introduction. If you're new, uh, uh, please get these books, these references that I'm going to mention here in a brief moment. Uh, what we do here is we explore uh, issues of blackness. We kind of lean towards how they relate to economics. We don't want we're going to move away from getting symbols. We want to know how to access and you know be part of America's financial discourse, financial landscape. At least be aware if we can't do much now. Be aware of what we're doing with our dollars. Two main uh, foundational principles can is kind of what I tease out here. And the first part has uh, two components, uh, both stemming from slavery. One is does the black mind of privation, um, marginalization, uh, vulnerability, uh, get passed down through generation to generation through slavery? Is it a cultural conditioning that has happened to black people over time? And same way, the second part is towards white folks. Does white entitlement, empowerment, privilege get passed down from generation to generation over time? Are the white people just as conditioned for privilege as black folks are conditioned? Conditioned for privation. Now, the second thought is to get people, uh, black people especially, to be aware economically how dollars work, what currency is. We haven't gotten serious about uh, dissecting some of those terms and components yet, but we, as black folks, need to understand we've been marginalized and pressed. We, we're, continue, we're continuing to serve society with our labor and our dollars. And uh, we're being, we're, we're not being treated fair in business and a lot of practices that still continue. But what I mean is I can move freely about, I can come and go, Yeah. Uh, out of my apartment at will, I can spend my money at will, but I'm confined to spending my money with groups that either already dominate me or that are winning um, in the level of competition against me. <laughs> so um, that's a starting point for black folks, Get, getting us to play the economic game rightly, or at least know the rules. You know, I'm confined to spending um, much of my dollars at Walmart, which is a Chinese outlet, you know, consignment store, uh, because places that uh, make American stuff, it's hard for me to get to, and blah, 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 blah you know, when I need things when I need razors and whatnot. There, there's an American alternatives, of course. But the Chinese and other nations have flooded the market with cheaper stuff that works just as well. You know, but those groups are in competition with black folks. They, they like our dollars, but they don't reciprocate our business. Some of those things, those issues I'm talking about when we talk about economic angle. What got me started on this was a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, just by happenstance, I, I know a friend of his. She introduced me to his videos, and I've been kind of on fire ever since. I haven't been this passionate about something like this in a long time. I'm a low-energy guy, <laughs> so try to take that as some uh, validation. Here, first book I read of his, and I've watched a lot of videos, hours of videos of his stuff, and I just can't get enough. He still speaks. He's probably still writing. Go to powernomics.com, 
get introduced to him, also the Heritage Institute, find more information about his overall um, projects going on. Uh, he's also helping out legally, trying to get the United States to wake up to follow through on their uh, promise for reparations to the slaves way back when. <laughs> His name is Dr. Claude Anderson. I read the uh, first book I read, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Uh, Mind-blowing stuff there. Um, black Labor, White Wealth Search for Power, Economic Justice. And finally, I read uh, his national plan to empower black America, Poweronomics. We're referencing this work uh, heavily for the next few days as we move through a series on political actions uh, blacks can take. You know, we will visit politics through the year, but he, um, he has some great plans laid out here and uh, we're just using this to warm up for the 2020 presidential election. Uh, candidates are still being named on both sides of the aisle and things. We're seeing things politically. I am hoping that we move past this kind of stagnation that has happened over the past four years behind the current president. And just so that things aren't always factual, uh, the pressing uh, explanation of slaves and labor and things like that. We'll take a fiction of the old count of slaves and labor and things like that. Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harry Beecher Stowe's work, mid 1800s, uh, used to be required reading in school. I'm not surprised it's not because it'll get especially black folks thinking about the continuation of issues of slavery in America. Uh, we've not, we're not that far from it. Okay, I'm not going to go too far. we got a whole program today of more on these political action steps. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we've got a whole year, we'll get to it. Hashtag us to hashtag USTOO. That's uh, find more black women there talking more about their specific issues. Now, of course, it's an open forum. Uh, also, uh, let's see, I mentioned Poweronomics, Heritage Institute, Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F, another place you can go, it's like a Black Facebook, and since we have internet, if you know how to dial up this YouTube video, then you know how to access all the kinds of information and you can fact check it yourself and all that. I want people just to start their, their, their noodle, to start simmering and thinking, <laughs> if you will. All right, today we're in political action step number two out of poweronomics.com. This is uh, his whole chapter seven on politics. And, um, you know, Dr. Anderson's burden is the... The black vote is so symbolic, you know. You know, we get the right to vote, but we're um, uh, confined to voting for candidates who don't work in our favor. We get candidates, maybe a black candidate, but then that person is more uh, a white puppeteer, uh, still not doing specific things for the black community. Um, but we don't get uh, fulfilled promises, we don't get follow through, what things like that. Uh, today's uh, piece is going to be about some of that, why some of that occurs. And uh, we'll get right to it here. It's political a action step number two. You in this is a lot of this is like expounded upon in, in the brief notes. Uh, so to challenge immigration laws and public policies that have forced black people to become this nation's only non-immigrant and permanent minority. It's competition out here for wealth and resources in America. It's not it's not like Star Trek 
Explorers equals, right? I, I think about some of the shows I grew up with and some of those idealistic shows where food and money is not a problem. Not so in real life. Uh, there's competition out here, uh, especially from the Hispanic community. This is not hate speech. We're just talking facts here about groups that want to subordinate blacks, marginalize blacks ju just as badly as whites did and still do here in America. Um, he finished, part of yesterday's uh, talk was finishing about politicians and politics it is where we're going to, uh, well, is one of the aspects of the fight uh, to, to get us back in a, in a state of prominence and recognition. We, we've just been beaten down and moved back. And um, our group self-interest, if we're going to participate in politics, then we might as well get people... Um, who promise some stuff in favor of blacks and they follow through or we have the power to get them out of office quickly. Um, so we got a, we're under attack uh, kind of from two sides here. We have been for the longest. Because of this nation's history with immigration, some of the laws they uh, that have been enacted, the 1790 naturalization law, uh, which declared America a white nation. You know, you already had blacks here running around. You had uh, slave owners, the men sleeping with their uh, slave women, producing all these children and all that. Uh, but they're, uh, I mean, they had the nerve to passed through Congress a law when um, when they're having all these orgies and, and sex pots on their plantations, uh, producing this whole uh, race of octoroon, quadroon, mulatto people. And, um, but because they, they are a mixture of black and white, they're considered tainted and they, so they go, well, let's make this a white only nation. And it, I mean, it goes further back than that, but the 1790 law is real. That they encroach and they encroach and they encroach. They don't get any pushback because their opponents are people that they can beat down physically and kill and lynch and separate their families and whatnot and starve or whatever abuse you can think of. That was that happened to black folks here in America. So our, our so that's the naturalization law, but our attack on us as far as immigration being the subject today is a two prong. One, we'll talk first about the illegal immigrants, mostly probably from our southern border. And uh, you know, you got people flooding and coming in by whatever means, sticking around long enough to get their paperwork done and be naturalized to become citizens of the United States. And these individuals come, stay off the radar long enough to get legal, and but they, they usurp black positions, black jobs, and all things like that. There can be an argument for blacks not showing up. I'm not going to I'm not going to present this argument like I'm naive and think that black folks are working hard out there and, and uh, there's a case for black folks being absent and not participating, you know. So it's I'm, not, I'm being realistic was what I'm trying to say about where black folks are at as these illegals are coming in. And, um, you know, it, because black folks are already 
in a vulnerable pos position, it's not so hard. We're already leaning. It's like, what's the saying? Uh, one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. <laughs> so in that is the black folks' uh, responsibility and peace. And that, we're going to keep that as part of the equa equation, realistically, here. And now, I'm sure there were some blacks are, you know, I'm out in the... Uh, I'm a blue collar guy myself. I'm not rich or wealthy. I've not had my breakthrough yet. I'm pushing. But um, I've been in, you know, out there in the blue collar world. It's inundated with Spanish speaking people, and the language uh, is very prevalent there. And uh, I'm a minority among a minority. Um, so whether it's illegal or legal, um, blacks, you know, left those spaces. It was, it was a win-win for white folks because that they, they kept their labor force. You know, plenty of white folks don't care if it's legal or illegal. As long as the, the work's getting done, they don't care. And they're going to favor, uh, the hardest working group, you know, plenty of hard working black folks, but we, we need to, we need to be present even to be in the fight. What's this lottery saying? You got to play to win. <laughs> now, the two prong attack, that's the illegal immigrants. Now, illegal immigration, a lot of the laws uh, from the 1790 naturalization law, and you'll find periodically laws to keep focusing uh, the uh, immigration laws, you know, find the Asians. I think it's 19, uh, so 1920s, 1924 immigration laws, uh, excluding Asians, you know, really, you know, just being so selective for their group. Uh, the white group is controls the power, so they're naturally going to gravitate towards us doing everything they can to assist their folks. So some of that is part of it too. Black nations, Haiti, African nations, they're extremely stringent on how uh, many people, those quotas and things like that, even to the point of absolute explicit exclusion of black folks on the immigration uh, list of immigration and their quotas and things like that. Um, but anyway, with the legal immigration, you know, think about Ellis Island and some of that stuff where the uh, Europeans are just flooding in. You know, you think as they came into uh, New York and flooded some of those neighborhoods and made their own ghettos, uh, Blacks being, it's now in that case, blacks, the blacks that were present were being um, ousted, uh, especially from service industry jobs, those uh, porters, hotel people, trains, you know, sweeping, uh, not much different than it is today. You go, uh, if you're in an urban area and there's a lot of construction going on, um, find generally White folks reading blueprints, commanding crews, Spanish um, doing. They've got a lot of skilled labor, Spanish, and they're, you've got your uh, general labor as the people cleaning up, um, you know, which is what I mostly did. I can do all that. Everybody's got the ability, but it was which what I did mostly, and only a few of us guys like when I'm out there. <laughs> see a black guy is like hey you know uh i was watching these let me just digress a minute i was watching uh, i like watching dogs i like dogs I, I know how to handle dogs and stuff and uh so i'm watching these dogs and when dogs see each other they're just so happy especially domestic maybe not a fighting dog but a domestic dog they're just just so happy 
tails a little, little wagging and stuff like that, and they play, they immediately start playing. You know, it's because they've been locked up with humans most of the day or alone, <laughs> you know. So when they're out for a walk and they find, they see one of their own, they, they go berserk, you know. That's how, that's kind of how I felt <laughs> when I was out there uh, sweeping up some building or something. You, you, you see some black skin, it's like, oh, brother, I've never, I've never seen you before, but hey, you know, I got I to gotta acknowledge you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you're a blue collar person, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so the immigration laws open the door and, they, you know, they, they open the door to those classified as white or are nearly white. The Spanish is a skin color, you know. Um, some of the nations uh, were unified enough where they so they had rally points, their language and stuff like that. And one issue, this kicked off uh, our political action step number one uh, yesterday. The, uh, he, Dr. Anderson, talked about uh, uh, the commonality of of slavery, of oppression, of marginalization being our common denominator. You know. It's a negative, uh, but it, I think it can be just as powerful as other groups, language, heritage, and all that stuff. It's the same thing. If you if you are into mathematics, where you could think of think of our negative, their positive, put that in terms of an absolute value, and then you'll see uh, see its validity. You know, but. But us black folks, we don't rally around our past. Every other group does. I mean, there's some particulars out there that black folks are missing that I'm finding I'm missing as I go through this study. Um, that we need to we need to rethink some things. There, there needs to be that the kind of revival that black folks needs is so it's it's got it's going to be so. It's got to be so revolutionary and, and very dynamic, you know, and very creative. I think we can do it. But our our slavery, striped backs, worked to death, raped, um, uh, being the son of a white man, but still being a but still being a slave, being sold and stuff, needs to be. A point of our strength um, uh, forward in our minds to give us our sense of our pride. Our st we, we black folks got a lot to do on their end. I'm not again. I'm not being naive about our part. Immigration, being a mindful of immigration and how it impacts us, is just as important. Um, so as these. Now, a couple things happened. In, in the 60s, once we got our momentum, Dr. King and others decided to soften their stance on making this a black issue. Now we're finding out years later that was a big mistake. So it's a, it's a failed experiment. I'm not going to go into that. Our time is getting short. But in that softening, he open the doors and uh, to minorities. Suddenly everything that walked, crawled, and breathed that was not white, or no, that was, there was some white in there. Um, but other groups, marginalized groups, groups that felt oppressed or outed outside of America's mainstream flooded in on Dr. King's rhetoric, and this, uh, the damage was all, uh, we'll say irreparable, uh, the momentum of it is still having its impact today because all these groups that came in, none of the groups that came in and piggybacked on civil rights uh, rhetoric and discourse 
fall below uh, blacks um, socially and economically in America. None of them, you know, they, they come along, here's, here's the dynamic, they come along holding up a banner saying minority, you know, that bandwagon, once they get their recognition, they leave off of the blacks. The blacks is just this foundation from off from what they step off of and move forward with. But uh, and I was writing this as I was putting this together. I realized, you know, ain't no group ever they they'll start out with all that uh, fanfare and using a lot of civil rights terms and stuff like that. But they they never come back. But black folks are just so forgiving and compassionate, inclusive, and all this stuff. We, we got to get together. We, we got to, you know, be just as exclusive and callous as all these other groups. It's okay. You know, we'll, uh, we'll take whatever lumps we have already. You know, stop shying away. Uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You might as well do, I think, in this case. Might as well do. Um, so the black leaders did that. Uh, prime example um, is uh, as the Cubans flooded into my, Miami. You know, we, we had Europeans up north in New York through Ellis Island, through all of that. Um, and then uh, down in the south, uh, kind of Cubans flooding into Miami, usurping black physicians, jobs, communities, things like that. And uh, uh, Dr. King's word on that was, again, another softening and an inclusion and all that uh, while, while black folks are getting murdered. And, and our, our whole, at that time of his, you know, the height, of his civil rights movement career, you know, so he, he's a focal point. Him, Jesse Jackson, a lot of names um, we can uh, uh, mention, Benjamin Hooks, Vernon Jordan, and, you know, they all followed his lead. He was the leader of that movement, you know, so he softened on the Cubans. And now Cubans, you know, maximized all of that um you know time ran out there, there's a lot here but we're just going to think about this we'll probably revisit this in the year uh further uh, he goes into uh, an initiative to re to relocate i'm not really for that i'm for uh growing and blooming where you're planted uh, last thing we need is blacks moving around the country trying to sequester land and resources. I think we, we can get our information. Blacks need to pause and reevaluate and think about what they're doing, why they're doing it, you know, um, to, to move would involve a whole lot of thought and a whole lot of serious understanding of that. Now, the, the plus side of moving, his point is that uh, with our numbers, we can then form a political base and move out and make some changes uh, from that position. Now, that's a good idea. It's a good idea, no doubt. I, I just don't I just don't see it happen. You're, you're you've got a whole lot of issues. We're already having an economic problem. Moving is something we do as a last resort under a serious economic duress or something like that. Or maybe there's a better job or something. There's there's got to be money or support or resources wherever we're going. You know, or there's no reason to go. First off, and, and second off, you, you, you don't want to. I don't think it'd be healthy for blacks to be moving about 
in such upheaval? And where would where would we go? Whose community is better? And these issues come up. I say physically, wherever you're at, just stay there. Think, understand why you're there. You know, work on your budget, watch your spending, learn about money, find out how you're marginalized. Look at the political system and see if your vote does count or not. Do does politics speak to your issues? All these things before you think about moving. So I, it's a good idea in theory and practice it may be problematic. Um, you know. So I will end just to reiterate some of our rally point. We, we should share our history. I think slavery, we, we need, I think we should live that. Not dress about in rags or all that, but have that a part of the conversation more more regularly. You know, well, we're out here mimicking and, and puppeting and behaving like all these other people who have not been touched by that kind of oppression. You know, I am a descendant of slaves, you know, so it's interesting. It was never part of my conversation growing up until Alex Haley put out Roots. Then it's an issue. No, it, like Alex Haley's family, the story should be told. I should, I should know who my Kunta Kinte is, you know, or what part of Africa, you know, now, granted, a lot of that stuff been pushed down and washed away uh, through conditioning and separation of families and keeping blacks under stress and duress. Uh, but there, there should be, I, I should know right off the top of my head, uh, you know, five, six generations back, I feel, you know, but now, you know, so much is lost. So that's today's piece. Immigration. Be be mindful of how immigration impacts you. Look around you um, when you're out and about, when you're in the workplace. Look at the different peoples. I've gone way over today because it's a big, long subject, but stick around. We're going to just keep moving forward. We may revisit this subject in, in a more refined way later this year. I'm Tomlin's Nyback. That's 365 days towards racial change. Thank you. See you tomorrow.